Hello and welcome back to the Burn KC Sportscast. I am your host, Alex Blackburn, here to bring you the good KC sports news. Got a little bit of a substantial show today. Um, Gotta go over the college football debrief, basically. A um, little bit to go over in regard to that. Um, have something that I really, really want to get into in regard to Lance Leipold in Kansas. Um, because there's there's something there uh, regarding a potential extension for Kansas's head football coach. So, going to get into that a little bit. Um, nothing really on Missouri and Kansas State's front. Obviously, you know, they, all three of them, finished in the final AP poll. Uh, Kansas ranked 23rd. I believe K-State was ranked 19th. And then, 19th or 21st, I can't remember. I believe it was... We will check and see. I believe... Oh, they finished 18th. Finished 18th in the final AP poll. And then Missouri finished 7th. Uh, right behind Florida State. No real surprise there. Obviously, you know, Florida State was undefeated until bowl season when their entire team left. Um, so, you know, they're... I'm not going to get into that whole playoff argument here because uh, you can go check college football dogs for that. Um, but we'll, we'll mainly be talking about Kansas. When do we not? <laughs> um, apologies if your school does not get the attention you think it deserves. I'm kind of a KU homer if you haven't figured that out. Um, but thank you for watching, and I appreciate your presence if you are a K-State and Mizzou fan. Um, I've kind of talked about our college football segment a little much. Uh, we're also going to talk about the Chiefs. We're going to talk about a certain rugby camp heading to the KC area here in the next couple of months. And finally... We have some conference opener reactions for college basketball. So strap in, sit tight, and enjoy the show. Okay. So let's start with some college football. Uh, like I said in the intro, all three teams finished in the AP Top 25 poll the first time in a very, very, very long time that that's happened. Um, I believe it's been over 20 years so that's pretty crazy um but congratulations to all three teams on good seasons uh there's bigger expectations though for next season for all three um missouri has an excellent recruiting and transfer crap class coming in uh so they should be a lot better to be honest um you know obviously you're losing guys like uh, Adams Drain, Cody Schrader, um, or Abrams Drain, my apologies, um, and Ernest Rickstraw as well. Uh, so key pieces, moving on to the NFL draft or transferring, but you've got one of the top five transfer classes in the nation right now, according to, to, to on three. Uh, you're bolstering that defensive line, you're bolstering the offensive line that's going to be you know, losing a lot of key pieces to either the portal or to the draft or to just running out of eligibility. Um, so big time pieces being picked up and big time moves being made by the Missouri Tigers. I uh, expect them to compete once again for an SEC championship. Um, as for K-State, K-State hasn't really all... They haven't been all that active in the transfer portal, as far as I've seen, at least. Uh, they had a decent signing class. Um, nothing too crazy to write home about. They're still hung up on the fact that 
we recruit the best in state. We recruit the best in state. You're losing that edge. I hope you know that. A good half of Kansas' football team is from Kansas. Um, and they're recruiting Kansas players, or Kansas high school kids, to play in at, at Kansas. And uh, the whole mantra that's been around since the Snyder era, mind you, of, well, K-State just recruits better locally, is starting to slip away. Because Kansas and Missouri are noticing that there's talent in-house that they can pick up. And the longer you gloat about having that in-state edge, the sooner you're going to lose it. Because the more you gloat about having it, the more schools are going to take notice. Oh, you know there are kids in the KCMO area, in the Kansas area, or in the Missouri area, that are really good at football. So it's, it's, it's funny how that's a double-edged sword. And it's also funny the fact that K-State thinks they're going to maintain that edge with how fast Missouri has caught up and how fast Kansas is catching up in terms of the local recruiting. So, you know, hold on to that while it lasts, I guess. You're not going to have it for very long. Kansas is being extremely active in the local community. I think they just picked up a couple kids from Blue Valley, if I remember right. Um... I know that the top recruit in the state is visiting for the class of 2025 is visiting here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, They're visiting Kansas. Um, So that whole mantra is just, yeah, it's really the only thing that Kansas state is going to be able to hold over the other two local schools heads for at least for now. Um, Again, like, you guys have lost Snyder. Kleeman's good. He's not Bill Snyder, though. So I'm I'm intrigued to see where recruiting goes and where talent goes over these next five years. So uh, as for Kansas, like I said, Kansas is the big in this, this topic. Um... Kansas got a commitment from a four-star linebacker, Mal- or excuse me, Malcolm Kirby, um, who chose Kansas over the likes of, I believe, K-State, Oklahoma, Michigan, who just won the national championship, mind you, uh, and others. So this is a huge pickup for the Jayhawks. He's going to fit right in um, come, you know, 2025. So... Big pickup for the Jayhawks there. Uh, congratulations to them. Uh, they also picked up the D2 Remington winner. Uh, if you don't know what the Remington is, the Remington is the top offensive lineman in the country. Um, and he was the top offensive lineman in Division II. Uh, let me clarify his name real quick. Uh, it's Andrew something? No, Shane. Shane Bumgardner. Uh, Shane Bumgardner, he played for Tiffin? Yeah, Tiffin University, if you know where that is. Um, I personally don't. I, I'm not entirely sure where that is. Um, you know, shout out to Shane for for committing. Uh, you're going to greener pastures, I guess. Um, but hopefully Tiffin treated you well. As far as the main story regarding Kansas, first and foremost, I put out an article on College Football Dogs regarding this issue, and it got over, let's see what it's at now. Um, Let me see. Let me see here. How many views did that get? 
Sorry for the radio silence, everyone. Uh, hits up to well over a thousand unique views. Um, so people care about this issue. Uh, and that's the issue of extending Lance Leipold. Um, so according to Mike Vernon, who is the Scoops Meister, if you know him, uh, he's got kind of the inside information on Kansas athletics, uh, along with Bryson Stricker, Michael Swain, uh, and multiple other sources, um, Lance Leipold and the Kansas Athletics Department are heating up in regards to extension talks. And what this is looking like right now is that Lance Leipold may become one of the top 15, if not top 10 highest paid coaches in the NCAA right now. And it's well-deserved. Because the turnaround that has happened at Kansas has been nothing short of miraculous. I mean, it truly has. This uh, A reminder, in case you forgot, <laughs> Kansas football was a dumpster fire for about a decade and a half. And Lance Leipold has them going 9-4 and four now. So... The, the the turnaround that has happened from going without a win in 2020, Lance, or excuse me, uh, Les Miles' is last year, to Lance Leipold coming in, and while only going 2-10, being competitive in pretty much every single game that year, and in winning over a Texas team in Austin, a lot of the Jayhawk faithful knew that something was there. And when 2022 came around, a lot of people were a bit skeptic, but the people that have been paying attention to this program knew that something big was coming. In my 2022 uh, Big 12 rankings, I put Kansas at, I believe, like 6 or 7 in the Big 12. And I believe they finished around there. So, I think a lot of people sorely sorely underestimated that Kansas team. But when the 2023 season came around, it was like, okay, you know... Kansas could definitely compete for a top five spot in the Big 12. And that's exactly what they did. Did they have some hiccups along the way? They absolutely did. That Texas Tech game was awful. They, and you know, if Jason Bean had started for the K-State game, I believe Kansas would have wiped the floor with them. If Jason Bean was at full health, they would have wiped the floor with them. Um, and then, you know, going into Stillwater, going to Boone Pickens Stadium. Boone Pickens Stadium is one of the craziest venues in college football. It is. I mean, the, that's a great home field advantage. Um, it's loud. It's rowdy. And the fact that Jason Bean had a ton of success there. He threw four touchdowns. Yeah, he threw a couple of back-breaking interceptions. But he still threw four touchdowns and for over 400 yards. That's not something many quarterbacks can say when they go to Boone Pickens Stadium. And the point, the point I'm trying to get at is, is that Lance Leipold has led this Jayhawk team into a new era, an era where Jayhawk fans can feel comfortable in believing in their football program, believing that their football program will do well. And it's shown in the donations. It's shown in the interest in the program. And it's, it's, it's about to show 
with how much Lance Leipold's going to get from the Kansas Athletics Department. Yeah, they're... <clears throat> they are in the process of building a new stadium. That's going to cost a lot of money as well. That being said, there's a lot of money still to be given to Lance Leipel. And if you know anything about college athletics, you know that college football is your moneymaker. I know that Kansas is a blue blood in basketball. I know Allen Fieldhouse is a basketball cathedral. But Kansas basketball can still be good while Kansas football is good too. And you can spend money on both. And that's exactly what Kansas Athletics is trying to do, is they're trying to build up enough funding to where football and basketball can be can run parallel to each other basically in terms of success and by extending Lance Leipold you're securing him for the long term i get that his that his contract runs until 2029 but he's the 29th highest paid coach in the NCAA right now. For a team that looks like they're going to compete for a Big 12 title next year. If I'm Travis Goff, I'm striking while the iron's hot. I am getting a deal done within the next week or two for Lance Leipold to be extended. And there's talks of getting him upwards of $7.5 million a year, which would put him in that top 15 range. I would estimate it to be around $9 million a year. I think that keeps him here long term. I think that it is a handsome salary for a coach that has given you the absolute world. And I think striking while the iron's hot and being proactive about this is the way you got to go about this. I'm not an AD, but I think it is a great marketing move and it's a big old, you know, F you, he's staying here. To other schools that, for example, I I've seen a lot of mention, I I've I've seen a lot of people mention Lance Leipold's name when talking about the potential Michigan opening if, if and when Jim Harbaugh leaves. That would be a huge statement to say, Nah, we're keeping Lance here. You can go look somewhere else. If you pay him that money, like right now, so that that is guaranteed. I think the people that are invested in it and know what's and, and are benefiting from Lance Leipold being here, such as, you know, the media people like myself, know that encouraging action and keeping this story in headlines is the way that Lance Leipold gets paid and paid handsomely. Because you're encouraging people to pay attention to it. And it's clearly seen that people want it done. So getting it done for Kansas and for the future of this football program is imperative. It's not only warranted, it's imperative for Travis Goff to do so. And I think he knows that. I, I think he's a great AD. I think he's got a great head on his shoulders. He's already imp He's already been a part of improving this program, this football program, by light years. So I think he gets a, I, and all signs point to a deal getting done within the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye on it. I know I'm going to keep my ear to the ground in terms of what's being said. Um, 
there's a saying in the industry, we like it quiet because that means something's about to happen. It's been pretty quiet on that front uh, for the past couple of days. So be on the lookout for something. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on to college basketball. Uh, got a few things to talk about there. So. I almost forgot the burning question, um, which is why we did kind of a jump cut between the end of the college football segment and the beginning of the burning question segment. Uh, so my apologies for that. But I asked you guys, who out of all the local teams had the best performance in their bowl game? And the results were kind of interesting. Um, the Instagram poll here has Missouri at 50%. I had them as, their, as the least impressive bowl win. And, you know, I get it. It's Ohio State. You know, they're, they're a football juggernaut. They're, they're, they're a football blue blood. But, I mean, that was their JV team play. It's... I, they had their third string quarterback in. They didn't have Emeka Buka. They didn't have, or did, I think they had him actually. Never mind. I, I think they had a, a Buka, but I mean, he was a non factor. They couldn't throw the ball. So even if Marvin Harrison Jr. was there, uh, like, there, there's a lot of factors that I'm like, you know, it kind of puts a damper on this Missouri Bull win. And it's still impressive, don't get me wrong, you know. That is a fantastic Ohio State defense that, you know, was one of the best in the nation and didn't lose all that many pieces uh, to opt out or transfer portal or drafting or anything like that. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. But, I mean, when you're facing an offense that is just completely gutted, eh, it, 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 it it could have been a cooler win if Ohio State had fielded their best and brightest. Let's just say that. Um, the next highest was was Kansas and UNLV. It was, it was, you know, as a Kansas fan, I I appreciate the fact that a lot of people believe that that was the most impressive win, but at the same time. It's UNLV. <laughs> they're, they're a Mountain West program. And while they were a very, very good Mountain West program, Kansas should have beaten them by a lot more, and they probably could have beaten them by a lot more if it hadn't been for the slew of penalties that were called against them. Um, you know, whether they were justified or not, there was a ton of penalties called against Kansas that kind of shot them in the foot. Uh, Jason Bean's three interceptions wasn't they weren't all that great. Um, <clears throat> he still threw six touchdowns and had a bowl leading bowl season leading 449 yards passing. Uh, so there's something to be said for that as well. Uh, I I had Kansas State and NC State um, as the most impressive win for the local teams and. Uh, you know, while we may not have seen Avery Johnson's, like, marquee performance, like his coming out party or anything like that, he still looked pretty good, um, both with his arms, both with his arm and with his legs, um, against a very, very, very good NC State defense. Again, top five in the country. Um, and just the rushing performance that they put on against them, I mean, DJ Giddens, is an absolute stud. Uh, and I think everybody in the Big 12, at least, knows that. 
Um, and he ran all over this defense. And yeah, they were missing some key pieces, but they were they really weren't missing all that much. And this is still an offense, an NC State offense, that can put up a ton of points against a K-State defense that was missing quite a few pieces. So overall, I think that's a pretty impressive win. Uh, all three of them were in their own in their own way, but as far as the win that impressed me the most, Kansas State, because honestly, I thought they would lose. So, and they were the only team that I thought would lose. So, there's something to be said for that. So, um, but moving on, okay. let's talk some college basketball. Um. Regarding conference openers, boy, howdy. Let's just continue Kansas' talk here. Um, well, let me let me first say that uh, Missouri's only down five to Kentucky at Rupp Arena, so that's that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and then Kansas State is down two to West Virginia in Morgantown, so. Both games to keep an eye on there. Um, I'll talk about them here in a few minutes. Uh, ooh, Houston's only down. Houston's down 10, too, I might add. Um, but Kansas. So Kansas, it, huh. it's a win. <laughs> but, oh, man, it was way too close for comfort against a TCU team that, has talent and looks really good, but it's a team that you probably should have beaten by a lot more if you're the preseason number one, if you're predicted for the Final Four this year. I mean, it it was a sloppy game by Kansas. Way too many turnovers. Um, just an overall bad shooting performance, too. Um I mean, I guess the field goal percentage was 53, but, you know, you had 18 turnovers, which is inexcusable. I mean, 18 turnovers against a team that you out, that that you're bigger than, that you're more physical than, even. Um, I get it, you know, Ernest Dude, yeah, he's a big physical guy. But he's a bull in a china shop. I mean, we saw that when he was at Kansas last year. He's a bull in a china shop. He's got a lot of raw talent. But Dickinson should have just been walking all over him. I mean, you know, he didn't. But he kept with them in a physical manner. Um, and the whole thing about... The flagrant call at the end and all the people complaining, that's not a flagrant, that's not a flagrant. Please read what a flagrant is before you spout off on it. A flagrant one does not have to be intentional. It just has to be a non-basketball move, which it was. You don't throw your elbow back. When the ball is in front of you. And. Ernest. Like I said. Is a bull in a china shop. He doesn't know how to move his body. By the looks of it. And it, and it showed the whole game. I mean. He's got a ton of raw talent. I mean. He's great in the paint. When he. When he can be. But. I mean, Hunter, Dick Hunter Dickinson should have. Hunter Dickinson put up thirty and eleven on him for a reason, and could have done better. And I think he frustrated Uday to a point of where he pulled that, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously, and it ended up costing him. I mean, you just don't throw elbows to the face just wantonly. You just don't. Like, it's, uh, you got to keep control of your body. And whether it was intentional or not, it's a flagrant either way. So, that was the right call. And then the whole thing about, well, Hunter traveled under the, bas under the basket for the game-winning shot. 
there is a very clear bounce of the basketball underneath the basket. If you go watch the tape, there's a very clear bounce. So get over yourselves. Um, Kansas travels to UCF next. It's It looks like a trap game, to be honest, because you got a big matchup against Oklahoma. That's going to be a tough one. Uh, UCF is not that good. Uh, Kansas should beat them pretty handily, but you're traveling to Orlando, and you just had a pretty rough day at the office against TCU. So it's got the workings of a trap game. So I, I would keep watch on that. Um, that or Kansas is just going to come up in there and whoop them. Who knows? I, I think it could go either way, to be honest. As far as the other two local teams go, I honestly completely forgot who Missouri played. Um, Let me look here. Oh, yeah, they played Georgia and lost. Um, I didn't watch this game personally, but I did. I was catching up on the highlights here. Um, the You got outclassed on rebounds. The three-point percentage was 31.6. Missouri has to find their shooters. I mean, they've got a lot of size and physicality, but they have to find their shooters. I mean, your top scorer only had 18 points. And while that's the case for Georgia as well, uh, you know, Sean East is the everyman. I mean, he's the leader in points, rebounds, and assists for this team. That's, uh, I mean, one guy can't carry a basketball team. And if I remember correctly... I mean, Nick Honors in there, he went one for seven and have five points. Isn't he supposed to be your big guy, like your big legendary dude? I mean, that that's horrible. And then your bench had three points. Missouri has to find their shooters. And Tamar Bates did pretty well, um, you know, it was pretty even scoring now that I'm looking at it. But the rebounds, Eden Shaw had a lot. That's good, you know, considering he's a forward. But, I mean, Sean East had eight assists compared to the next highest guy, Carter, who had three. There needs to be some continuity in your scoring, and there needs to be more sharing the basketball by the looks of it. So, you know, after Kentucky, which you're keeping with Kentucky right now, so that's a good sign. Um, Thus far, by the looks of it, you're improving on those stats. I mean, well, Nick Honor still only has three points. Um, And then East has 15 again. So, and then your bench has four. Not ideal. Um, But, you know, being down only five against the number six team in the nation, that's something, there's something to be said for that. Uh, We'll be keeping up with that game. I don't think it'll end by the time I'm done with this, but um, on the off chance that there is uh, some action in that game that I get word of while I'm recording these, um, I'll be sure to maybe tack it on at the end or something like that. But Kansas State. Kansas State didn't really have all that rough of a time with UCF, which makes me even more scared that UCF is going to be a trap game for Kansas. Um, they ended up winning by 25. Uh, and yeah, it was at home, but I mean, Kansas State probably had their best performance of the year against UCF. Uh, they were sharing the ball pretty well um, by the looks of it. You know, Tyler Perry had 25 points. He was 6 of 11 from 3, which is awesome. Uh, that's what they brought him there for. I mean, 
very good performance on his part. And Gasson had 14 rebounds. I mean, just a beastly performance in the paint. Um, and, you know, your bench actually did pretty well in scoring. Um, you got seven, eight, nine. You got 10 bench points, which isn't spectacular. But, you know, when your starters are putting up 25, 12, 14, uh, and 11, uh, you know, other than Gasson, uh, everybody's got double digit points. You're doing something right. So, good win by Kansas State. They are down two to a West Virginia team that is five and nine right now. So, that's something to look out for. Uh, I think they turn that around. They have every opportunity to, at least. Um, but it's definitely something to look out for um, in regard to how they're performing. Uh, hopefully they can get that turned around and bring home a W from Morgantown. Morgantown's a tough place to play, so that's probably why they're struggling. Um, but they can definitely turn it around uh, if they just you know, show that continuity as a team. Uh, they have Texas Tech next, too. So uh, it doesn't get a whole lot easier. Uh, Texas Tech at Tech, mind you. So uh, big day for college hoops. We'll see how those two games go. And then Kansas has their matchup with UCF uh, tomorrow. No, on Saturday, I believe. Or is it Wednesday? It is Wednesday. Okay. Let me clarify that real quick. I believe it's Wednesday. No, I don't want the SEC. It is Wednesday. Yeah, okay. So it's tomorrow. My apologies. Um, and then Oklahoma's on Saturday. So sorry for getting those days mixed up. Okay. So let's talk both the Chiefs and Royals because something came up regarding that and a joint statement that both teams made. Um, let's go ahead and pull that tape here. I'm just going to go ahead and read it because I'm not, I don't think I'm authorized to show it. <laughs> it's, it's on social media. If you want to go check out uh, either the Chiefs or the Royals social media, it's a joint statement. Um, what it says is, we thank the Johnson County legislators and county executive Frank White for their decision today. We still have a lot of work to do, but this is an important step towards giving John, excuse me, Jackson County, uh, Jackson County voters the opportunity to decide on April second. Uh, it guarantees that the Royals are at least staying in Jack. I keep on wanting to say Johnson County. I live there, um, but they're going to stay in Jackson County. Um, you know, I'm not surprised to be, to be frank, like, I think you had a lot of complainers, myself included, that really did not want the Royals to move too far. Uh, I think a downtown stadium is a good idea if you can pull it off, um, and if Jackson County wants to, if Jackson County wants to pay for it, which is the next statement that I'm going to go over here. Um, Kansas City Chiefs and Kansas City Royals commit more than 200 million in economic benefits to Johnson County as part of a path forward. The Kansas City Chiefs and the Kansas City Royals today announced their commitment to remain in Jackson County if Jackson County voters approve an extension of the three eight cent tail sales tax on a ballot initiative this April. The Chiefs and Royals have partnered with Jackson County for 50 years in a partnership that has worked well for all constituents. Uh, as part of the proposed agreement between the teams in Jackson County, the teams have agreed to provide more than $200 million in new, economics, new economic benefits to Jackson County over 40 years in the new lease agreement, alleviating 
the county's obligation to pay stadium insurance premiums as well as the park levy to the teams. Under the agreement, the Chiefs will conduct an extensive renovation to the iconic Arrowhead Stadium. The Royals will build a new downtown stadium and privately fund a $1 billion ballpark district. And that's about all I'm at liberty to read. Um, the TLDR of that is the Royals and the Chiefs are staying in Jackson County for the foreseeable future. The Chiefs are going to get a renovation, and the Royals are going to get a new downtown stadium with a privately funded, they finally specified that, <laughs> a privately funded uh, be uh, a baseball like entertainment district, which is cool. Uh, and I'm very happy that it's privately funded. Because I don't think Jackson County would want to pay for that for that project. And when that project came about and they weren't really specific as to who exactly was going to pay for that, yours truly was a little mad. And I know a lot of other people were really mad too. But this is, it's reassuring. It is. Um, the 3-8 sales tax may still be a hot button issue um you know but it's I, I believe it's the same thing that is going on right now is it not yeah it's it is it's an extension of that tax um gosh there's a lot of people that are saying there's a possibility that it's going to go over go over budget, blah, blah, blah. But basically, you know, that it's it's the same sales tax that exists already, that 3-8 sales tax. They're just going to extend it. And, you know, it's not a surprise. They need some public funding. Uh, but the commitment to two hundred billion in revenue is something. Um, but we'll 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 have to see if that ends up being anything. Um, because I, I, there's a lot of warranted skepticism with the Royals. Uh, it took them a long time to put this statement out, and. While it's a welcome statement and it's a reassuring statement, a lot of people are like, well, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. And I'm kind of a, of that mindset as well. But I do like the fact that they're at least being transparent now. That they know what they're doing by the looks of it. As far as, you know, where they're going to go with this new stadium. But at the same time, you know, I I do feel for the people that are saying, well, it's going to go over budget. You know, uh, they're going to ask for more money from the public. Um, you know, don't believe don't believe it when they say it's privately funded, or don't believe it when they say it's it's going to provide two hundred billion in uh, economic impact for Jackson County. Um, there's some merit to it given the fact that a lot of sports teams have done that to their cities, I think the hunts for sure, the Chiefs owners, wouldn't let that happen. They've, they're, they're servants to Kansas City. They love this town. There's a reason that, you know, the Chiefs have been basically the crown jewel of this city for a while. Um... Well, since the Mahomes era. <laughs> um, and, and it's because they bring in a lot of money. And when it comes to the Royals, you know, there's still that question. So I believe it when Clark Hunt says it. But I'm like, you know, do I believe John Sherman? 
Is this lip service? Because frankly speaking, you got to put a better product out onto the field before you go making these wanton claims about how you're going to commit $200 billion in economic impact. There's no guarantee of that if your team sucks. So, you know, again, there's some merit to those those people saying, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. And uh, given the fact that the Royals are investing, at least, in their team now, the the on-the-field product itself, that's also reassuring. So that's why I'm not entirely in the I'll believe it when I see it game. So I, I think there is a concerted effort to make this team good and to make this team watchable. So that's that's pretty much all I have on that. Okay. So let's move on to some more Chiefs talk. Uh, the Chiefs looked solid against the Bengals. They, they looked pretty good. That was probably one of their... They're better full team efforts that we've seen this year. And, you know, they're pretty motivated against the Bungles. So, which is quickly becoming a rivalry, um, if if not already. Um, And then what we saw this past Sunday with the Chargers is, number one, Blaine Gabbert looked like Lamar Jackson if he had a noodle for an arm. Um, with all those running performances, way to go, old man. Um, gosh, he, he, Blaine Gabbert had some, had some wheels. Uh, I, that was kind of surprising, and it ended up winning us the game. So, congrats to Blaine Gabbert on, I think it's just like his sixth win as a starter, which is kind of sad. But when you're a journeyman backup, it's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, I'm not sure how many wins Chase Daniel had as a starter. I can't be... I'm not positive. Um, But, you know, going up against a full-strength Chargers team, well, aside from, you know, Justin Herbert, it's pretty good uh, to to, to win 13-12. to So, defensive contest for sure. (laughs) Um, But what we learned from... From Sunday, this past Sunday. Does Miko Hardman deserve more snaps? Is a question that we asked. Um, I mean, it's the playoffs. It's win or go home, so you don't get a learning experience like you've gotten for, I guess, the past 18 weeks. At least that's what the Chiefs have been telling us in regards to the wide receiver room. Oh, it's a learning experience. We'll get better. We'll get better. Blah, blah, blah. It's playoffs, guys. It's win or go home. And against the Dolphins team that is that can catch fire when it comes to offensive play, um... You got to be able to keep up with them. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes was saying, you know, they're going to throw a lot of deep balls and that's how they win this game. I'll believe it when I see it. Can, can, can your receivers catch said deep balls? Because that's that's the only way you're going to win that battle. Tyreek Kill can catch footballs. Yeah, he's had some bad drops, but he can catch footballs a lot better than MBS can. Um... And then you got, you know, Cedric Wilson. Yeah, I think Jalen Waddle's going to be back. Uh, and, you know, Chase Claypool's there too in, a, in, a, in, his, in his own little way. Um, so this is, this is not, you know, a learning experience. It's we got to go and we got to go now. And I'm hoping the Chiefs know that because otherwise they're going to get dog walked. If if their entire passing scheme is through Travis Kelsey like it has been for a while now, it's going to be a rough one, I feel like. 
Uh, and yeah, this is not a Charger defense, or not a Charger, a Dolphin defense that is at full strength. They're missing a ton of pieces, but this is still a Dolphin defense that has been solid in certain games. Definitely not against the Ravens, but you know they they've had some good performances, and this is not Germany. Dolphins are going to be looking for revenge, so I think there. I think we have to be wary in trying new things. And I get it. You know, Hardman's been here before, and you know he he showed a lot of really good reliability and speed and skill um, against you know a full strength Charger defense. But I mean, it's a little late to be trying new things. And I think that's the mindset that the Chiefs have going into this game is, you know, maybe give me Miko Hardman a few more snaps, but a lot of those snaps are going to be going to guys like MBS, unfortunately. So at least that's that's my gut feeling uh, just just with how this 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 year has gone so far. Um, But we could we could certainly see something different. Um, there's offensive line issues, though, that also need to be worried about. Um, Donovan Smith's back, but that's only because Wanya Morris got injured. And he's not, he hasn't been practicing, so expect Donovan Smith to start that playoff game. Um, and then on the right side, Jawan Taylor. Yes, I know he's been horrible this year. He's out and injured, I believe. He I, Actually, I think he practiced today. I think he practiced today, so that's a good-ish sign. But, I mean, it's Juwan Taylor. <laughs> he's, like, the most penalized player in the league, and... Oh, if he does not get his 2022 form back, there's going to be a world of hurt on that right side because, yeah, the Dolphins have lot of, have lost a ton of edge players this year. They're down to a skeleton crew, but that skeleton crew now includes Jason Pierre-Paul, Melvin Ingram, and. Justin Houston, the chief, the former chief, Justin Houston, and the former chief, Melvin Ingram, <laughs> and, and Emmanuel Ogba. Like, gosh, it's like the 2016 Chiefs defensive line. <laughs> and, you know, man, if they, I mean, those are guys that have playoff experience. Jason Pierre Paul is there too, mind you. And he's won a Super Bowl. Melvin Ingram's won a Super Bowl. Justin Houston hasn't. But, you know, there's playoff experience guys on that defensive line. Jawan Taylor has a single game, I think, in the playoffs. Not great. Not great. Maybe two. I honestly can't remember. Um, so I just have a gut feeling that this is going to be a potential rough one for the Chiefs. Um, the team definitely showed that they have depth at the very least. But is it going to be enough? Is it? too late to incorporate that depth and incorporate, you know, Miko Hardman into the starting rotation of receivers and do everything of that sort. I think it is. So the Chiefs got to put up or shut up. And if they don't put up, they'll be shut up for the rest of the season. So we'll see how everything goes. I'm, I, I feel pretty meh 
about this one. It's the next one that I'm really worried about. But we're going to take these one at a time. So, all right. Let's talk about PR7s, and then we're going to wrap this baby up. Uh, if you don't know what PR7s is, it stands for Premier Rugby 7s. And it is basically the Professional 7s Rugby League. And it's based out of the United States. It features, I think there's eight men's teams and eight women's teams. Six to eight. I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, there's around that many teams for both men and women. Um, so it's it's a it's not a co ed competition, but there's a men's league and a women's PR sevens league. And they basically travel around the country, play tournaments, um, and scout players uh, to play in this PR sevens league. And they will be coming to Kansas City January 28th to scout out the best and brightest in Kansas City rugby. Um, I know that there's going to be a good handful of Blues players there. I'm sure there's going to be players from the local colleges. Um, we're probably going to have, you know, KCRFC players there as well. Um, and, you know, anybody that wants to try their hand at becoming a professional rugby player, um, you know, go out to this event at over, uh, it's somewhere in Overland Park. Let me clarify. It's at St. Thomas Aquinas High School. So home of some really, really good rugby, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, that's where the tryouts will be held. I may make an appearance, but I don't think I'm going to be trying out. I am a little bit too big and slow for sevens. Um, but you know, good luck to all my friends and all of my teammates that will be going out and trying their hand at becoming a professional sevens player. Um, I've already had a couple friends that have gone, th or friends and teammates that have gone through that circuit. Uh, Kyle Renner and Aaron Martin are both guys that have gone through the PR seven circuit as well as Amanda Hole as well uh, for the women's side. So. I believe all three of them are going to be retrying um, for their shot at professional sevens. Um, but it gets you recognized um, and it could potentially get you into Olympic competition and get you looked at for the USA sevens pool. So um, it's, it's worth, it's worth at least looking at if, if you've ever been interested. So um, I'm hoping to see some good results for the people that I know that are going out. Uh, I have a lot of friends and teammates that are going out to that. Um, and I may go out and cheer y'all on. So look for me, look for me. Um, but that's basically our show. Uh, thank you for joining me on this fine Tuesday night. Uh, or if you're watching later, Wednesday, Thursday, etc. Um, I'm going to have a Scorchcast released, hopefully within the next week. <laughs> um, or I should have something released by Tuesday of next week, uh, is how I meant to say that. But be on the lookout for some new features regarding the Scorchcast. Uh, I know that I've said this before, but I promise you it's going to be happening within the next week. Um, I have the green screen software put onto my system or onto my computer. Just a matter of where exactly I'm going to set said green screen up um, because there's really, I'm on my couch right now. Um, it's really not a great place to set it. Maybe across here, but we'll see. I mean, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking about potentially moving back to that kitchen table. 
Uh, my butt does hurt after a while of sitting over there, so I may bring a cushion. But, you know, um, just we'll, we'll, we'll have it figured out by next week. Uh, like I said, I've messed around with the software a little bit. Uh, I got it pretty much figured out uh, as to how I'm going to incorporate it. So, um, you know, look out for some new features regarding your Burn KC Scorchcast. Um, that being said, this has been the Burn KC Scorchcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great evening or morning or day, uh, depending on when you're watching. And I shall see you next episode. Thanks.